If you were here last week, you know what I mean by this phrase, Cascadia. Here in Cascadia, we often hear people say things like, just be yourself. Just do your own thing. Or, I don't know about you, I've heard people say things like, well, I am not, um, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. I'm spiritual, I'm not religious. Or, I've, I've heard people say, well, I love Jesus, I just don't love the church. Now, on the surface, those kinds of statements, they sound like that's very freeing. Oh, wow, you can just, just go make, make your own way, call your own shots, create your own sort of fluid spirituality, live independently. But where that, that kind of life leads, the outcome, the natural outcome is confusion, loneliness, emptiness, depression, and even self-harm, because that is what we see behind the scenes in Cascadia. That's what ails the people of Cascadia. And we're in Cascadia. We're in this region of the country. The, the, the deal is you and I, you're not designed to do it on your own. You're not designed to live life on your own. You're not designed to live life like on a floating island. I read a book once that had floating islands. You know, islands aren't, they're not floating. They're like a mountain that comes up from the, the bottom of the sea, you know, islands don't move. But in this fictional story, they were on floating islands. And when, if that is the way it is, nothing is stable in your life. If everything's changing, we're, we're just not made to live like this. You and I, you need a rock to build your life on. You were made for more than just living on a floating island. If you've got a Bible or a tablet, uh, maybe you've got the U version app, Y-O-U version app, Bible app, why don't you get it out and let's get God's word in your hand. Would you turn with me to Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. And we're, we're going to come back to that in just a minute, but let's let you get that dialed up. So we're in this series called Made for More. And what we're specifically talking about, uh, and we started talking this last week, about the church, how the church is made for more. It's not just a group of people. It's, it's made for something significant. And you, as part of the church, you are made for more than just living life your own way. Last Sunday, we talked about specifically, you are the church built on Jesus a house for his presence, and not even death can stop you. It, it, if you, if you have, for some reason didn't uh, catch last week's message, I encourage you to watch it online because I, I think that it sort of set the tone for the rest of, the, of this series that, that's coming up. So I want to just break down that, that phrase just, just a little bit. First of all, you are the church. I want you to know in English we don't see this, but the word you that we're talking about here is plural. So it's not like you individually, it's you, you all, you all are the church. And, you know, it seems like salvation from sin, that seems like a very personal, individual thing. And it is. But the thing that we sometimes forget is that you are not only saved from something, you are saved to something. And you are saved to a people. You are saved to belong to the people of God, the church. You, plural, are called by God for a purpose bigger than yourself. And that's exciting. That is motivating. That is uh, awesome to, be, to have this calling. And you and I, we all have this calling together to experience the kingdom of God and to expand the kingdom of God, to experience and expand the kingdom of God. Expanding the kingdom of God in your corner of the world and also in the four corners of the world. Both, we're a part of that mission. You are made for more than just working nine to five. What a way to make a living. You can lose your mind. That's all taken and no given. You are made for more than that. Second part of that phrase, you are built on Jesus. You plural, you're built on Jesus. First Corinthians 3.11 in the Bible says, for no one can lay any other foundation, the foundation we're talking about, the church, other than the one we already have, 
It's two words. You know what those words are? Jesus Christ. He's our foundation. The church is built on him. You are built on Jesus. Jesus initiated the kingdom of God by his preaching and teaching. And he demonstrated the kingdom of God by healing diseases, by doing miracles in nature like walking on water, multiplying food, uh, raising the dead. He, he demonstrated the kingdom of God by delivering people from the influence of the devil. The kingdom of God is awesome. It is amazing, and it's great to be a part of it. Okay, so you are the church. You are built on Jesus. Number three, you are a house for God's presence. You, plural, are a house for God's presence. In another place in the Bible, in 1 Corinthians 3.16, it says, All of you together are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God lives in you. You together. Now, we, we tend to want to always go individual, and we just say, well, I am a temple. And yes, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. But also, the body of Christ is collectively a house for the presence of God. Amen. This building where we have gathered today, these boards, this concrete, these nails, these uh, walls, that is not the church. That is a building, a place where the church gathers. So even this house, this physical house, that is not what is the house intended to create or to house the presence of God. You and I are. The presence of God, you feel the presence of God here because the church has gathered. And the Holy Spirit has come with us. And he is here. As soon as Jesus returned to heaven and his Holy Spirit was poured out on the church, the church started gathering in congregations. And I'm about to read you a Bible passage, Acts 2.42, and listen, as I do, listen to the tone. Listen to the atmosphere of the church. Listen to the environment. Listen to the results. What is the result of these gatherings? Just get a sense of the vibe of the church. Acts 2, 42 to 47. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. We sometimes miss that. The early church devoted themselves just to hanging, just to hanging out together. And it's in the Bible. And they devoted themselves to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper. Well, we call it communion today. And to prayer. Listen to what happened then. A deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. This is all a description of the church. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. So that's one kind of gathering. And they met in homes for the Lord's Supper. That's another kind of gathering. So they, they had all these gatherings and they shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. That's interesting. They were in a very pagan setting where the empire of Rome was in charge. And yet all the people praised them. They, they were like, man, you guys are awesome. I want to be part of that. Uh, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of the people. And each day, somebody say each day. Each day. Each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Do you catch the vibe of the church? Do you catch the, the, the atmosphere, the description? The church is awesome. And it, it's really interesting for me through my eyes when I read that passage, and maybe you notice this too, you can see that all seven of our NFC core values, which are on the wall, happened in this one little section of scripture, this one description of the church. All of our NFC core values, we are worshipers. We live and love the Bible. We are better together. 
We always pray. We live generously, giving and serving. We share Jesus. We speak life. That is, we, we want to be like that, what I just read. And, can I just say it shamelessly, we want to see results like that. We want to see signs and wonders being done. We want to see devotion to teaching and fellowship. We want to see people added to the church every single day. Oh, yes, that is what we're, that's what we want. The problem with values is that our practice is not always congruent with our values. And this can happen in any area of life, including the church, talking about our core values, but just your values and my values. We, we have a value. I, I really value this. But it does not automatically happen that you act like that. It takes intentionality. It takes a decision. It takes effort. And right now we're in this series. We are focusing on the church. We're focusing, focusing not so much just on each individual, but we're, we're looking at the group. And so we're looking at we versus me right now. We're looking at we. And so I thought it, it would just be really interesting to just stop kind of at the beginning of this series. And let's evaluate our we time. You know, we so much, you, I bet when I said that, you thought, did he say me time? Because that's what we're usually talking about is I need more me time. But we're talking about we time. Let's evaluate our we time at NFC. Are we living out the values of the early church, like I just read about? Or are we living out the values of present-day Cascadia? What, what are we actually doing? We, we know what we value we know what we think, we know what we believe, but are we doing that? Let, let's just ask, I, I, help me evaluate together. How much time every week do we as the church worship together? It was kind of cool, I was over at some friend's house uh, a week or two ago, and they said, hey, in, in just a little while, we're having a worship night at home. And I just, I was like, yes, that is so awesome, that is the church worshiping together. But how much time do we actually worship together? How much time every week do we pray together? If you're counting up the service time, I can tell you it's five minutes. If that's, if that's our only togetherness time. Is it true in practice that we always pray? We, we always pray. Is that true in practice? It's our value. How much time every single week do we at NFC gather together to study the Bible, discuss the Bible, which you can only do with others. <laughs> I mean, you can have a discussion with yourself. It's just not as stimulating. Uh, how, how much time do we apply the Bible, discuss the Bible, and uh, let iron sharpen iron with the Bible together? How much time do we together as a congregation share Jesus together? How much time every week do we serve together? I can tell you this, that a feeling of connection, like in any area, so let's say a feeling of, of connection to God, that happens from a couple of different things. A, a feeling of connection to your family happens with a couple of different things. A feeling of connection to your spouse, that happens with a couple of different things. And a couple things that I have noticed help that feeling of connection are one, Consistency of presence. Consistency of presence. Every word there, super important. Consistency means day after day, week after week, being together. Presence means being there, being checked in and being there. I, I think about like the family dinner table. When you have, uh, especially when that, in that period of time when you have uh, younger kids at home. If family dinner, like for us, family dinner time, back in the day, it was 5.30 every day, we had dinner together, and the, the four of us, we had a family of four, were always together. Like, that was the norm. And that's where we would talk about our day. That's where I heard that um, we, on Jared's first day of kindergarten, we said, what'd you learn today? He goes, horizontally, horizontally. That's what he learned. It was at dinner that I learned that. Like, wow, I'm so glad we were together. But can you imagine a family dinner table, like maybe that's not your together this time, but it was ours, where just a couple people 
I showed up each day at family dinner, and it wasn't always the same people. So let's say sometimes my two sons, just Jared and Stephen, uh, they just show up to dinner. How much dinner do you think is going to be on that table? I'm going to tell you what, that dinner is going to look different <laughs> if mom and dad didn't show up that day. And, and each, each combination, uh, it, it affects that togetherness. So consistency of presence leads to a feeling of connection. Connection thrives when there is a consistency of presence. And in the church, uh, consistency of presence are the people that you see each week or the people that see you each week, each time we gather. So consistency of presence makes connection thrive. A second thing that makes connection thrive is variety of venue. Variety of venue, a variety of settings. So large group in the church, large group settings, small group settings. A connection thrives in a variety of settings together. Now, the family, for as an example, uh, we ate dinner together every day, and that was sort of regular. It was routine. The table always, we always sat uh, in the same places uh, in, in our house every day. We sat at the same places. There was no question where we sat. It was very predictable. Uh, and uh, I love leftovers. And early on in our marriage, I said, give me leftovers. That's great. So we normally have the same thing two days in a row. We uh, alternate chicken, beef, fish. We, like, there are some very predictable things that happen. There are some very routine things. And yet, in, within that routine, it was special because that's where we got to hear about the fact that Stephen got stabbed at school today <laughs> in the hand. Uh, there, are thing that, there are things that just come out but because it's predictable and consistency of presence, there's an opportunity for that to come out. But also, there was variety. So sometimes we went out for dinner. Sometimes we went and played putt-putt together. It's our, one of our two family passions, putt-putt and sarcasm. Those are our two family passions. And so we, were, we had consistency at the dinner table, but we also had variety of venue. We also did other stuff together. We went on walks together. We went on vacations together. We went to a movie together. There's different things we did together, and all of that together caused connection to thrive in our family. I feel like we're a close family. We do stuff together. Even to this day, our family has expanded every birthday. Man, we try. It may not be on the day, but we're going to get together, have special food, and be together. The, the same thing happens in the church. We thrive when there's consistency of presence and when there's variety of venue. Sometimes we come and we gather. We're all facing the front, and we, we worship, and we give, and we listen to the word. And in other times, we gather together like for things like um, together nights or other settings where we're, 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 we're seated differently. We're looking at each other. We're, we're talking to each other. We're applying the Bible together. On any given Sunday morning, uh, we've, we've, we've looked at the math. On any given Sunday morning, about a third of our congregation is present. And it's a little bit different. That third is a little bit different each week. About half of that number comes back on Sunday nights for together nights. And it is powerful. I love my, my men's group. That's the one I'm with on, on Sunday nights. We are seated in a circle. We're looking at each other. We're watching a video together. We're discussing the Bible together. And it's in that setting, and it has already happened in a very short season, where, where it, it, someone uh, is asking a question about the Bible, and it, it gets answered in, a, in really cool ways uh, that maybe would not have happened in another way. A very small percentage of our congregation makes it out to our two prayer gatherings. Our main one is Wednesday nights and then Sunday mornings before, before the service. And I'm telling you what, on Wednesday nights, we have such powerful teaching. And like, I take notes uh, if I'm not teaching because it is so good. And we have powerful times of lifting our voices and calling out to God in prayer together. Uh, it, it is each setting just is the body of Christ in a different way. And each setting helps me and those who are a part of them to feel connected. Connection thrives in consistency of presence and variety of venue, variety of settings. We really are better together. We really are. Yeah. I have learned how to pray 
I, I have learned about open heavens and things like that uh, in prayer gatherings. We're, like, I'm better. We are better together when those things happen, when we have consistency of presence and when we have variety of venue. We are really better together, but we're not really together very much as a church. When we are together, we sometimes feel more like fans in the stands than players on the field. Fans in the stands, there's a little bit of a connection in that they're all watching a game and rooting for a win. They're rooting for the same cause. Yes, we love that cause. But really, when you go away from those seats after the game, you're never going to talk to any of those people in the crowd again. Jesus calls you and me to get in the game, to get connected, to engage. Now, I've got some good news for you. The good news is that when you really engage in the church, I'm talking about the church, the big C, capital C, the church, those who are following Jesus, when you really engage in the church, you will discover the cure for what ails Cascadia. The cure for that emptiness that's deep inside, the cure for that, that longing to worship, that, that cure for depression, you will discover that when you engage in the church. You will find the cure for what ails Cascadia, and you might also find the cure for what ails you. We just don't always think about it that way, but it's there. And here's what I mean. Studying God's word with other believers, it replaces your confusion with clarity about what's really true. And we've already seen it. We, it's, it's so cool. Time and time again, I had great conversations with people in the lobby about how, you know, I was going down a certain way. I was brought up to believe this certain way, but now I see from God's word, this is what's really true. There's clarity that comes instead of confusion about what's really true. Being prayed for, I'm talking about the cure for what ails us. Being prayed for and even praying for someone else. You might be the type of person that you're like, I got tons of people praying for me. I don't need people praying for me, I'm good. But when you pray for someone else or when you are prayed for, all of a sudden, instead of feeling lonely, you feel loved. And it happens both ways. When I pray for someone else, they've, they've been vulnerable enough to say, man, I'm, I'm looking for a job or uh, my, my foot hurts. When, when I'm able to pray for someone else, man, I, I feel closer to that person. And when I'm able to say, man, I got struggles in my life, would you pray for me? I, I feel loved. It's the cure for what ails us. Doing things like serving in kids' church in order to help kids discover Jesus for themselves or doing things like running the computer slides or a camera to help people worship in the room or online, or leading a carnival game, or cooking up hot dogs at the fall festival to introduce your community to Jesus and to our church, or simply greeting people at the front door on Sunday mornings, or playing your instrument in worship band. All these things are done in teams, all of those things I've just mentioned, and I, I just don't even have time to mention all the ways that we serve. And serving this way, serving on a team in the church gives you fulfillment instead of emptiness. Serving gives you joy instead of depression. It is actually the cure for depression. When you get your focus off of the hard, hard things in your life and you get them on to helping someone else with their hard, hard things. All of a sudden, God's love and joy comes into your life. Serving on a team in the church gives you self-worth instead of self-harm. It is amazing what God designed for our benefit and for our good. You are the church. You are built on Jesus. You are a house for God's presence. You, not even death could stop you, the church, you plural. And Jesus has given you the keys to the kingdom of God. 
the kingdom of heaven, to open the door for the people around you and to invite them in. You are the church. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock, the rock of Jesus, the rock of faith in Jesus, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid or bind on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit or loose on earth will be permitted in heaven. Would you stand to your feet and let's sing this together. This rock, you build your church and the gates of hell will not prevail. your church around the world, but you're also building NFC. And Lord, we want to be a part of building your church. We know that the church is people. We know that you work through people. And Lord, we want to be that group against which the powers and gates of hell will not prevail. We want to be that, that group of people that does not fail because we are on mission with you and we are in your church. Lord, build your church. Build your church here. Build your church in us. Build us as individuals, but build us together as a group, Lord God, in Jesus' name. And I just want to ask you, how many of you would say, I want to engage with the church? I want to be part of the church. I don't want to be left out. I don't want to be left behind. I want to be a part of the church. Amen, amen. How many of you would say, I'm even willing to take one new step? Maybe it's just to be consistent on Sunday mornings. That would be a great step. Or I want to come and pray, or I want to come be part of the together night. So just one step. I want to serve in some way. If, you're, if you would say, I want to take one new step, can I just see your hands as well? And let's engage. Yes, Lord Jesus, you see our hands. We want to be a part of what you're doing. Lord, we don't want to be left out. Lord, we want to follow you. We want to be, we want to know the people on either side of us through serving, praying, giving. We, we want to move your mission forward. We want to see our church thrive. And I'm in the church. Each of us is the church. It's not them out there. We want to thrive. We want to feel connected. We want to feel supported. We want to feel like significant, like we're doing something for Jesus. Lord, let that be the description of NFC, of our congregation. Let that describe us, Lord God. Lord, we're all in. Build your church through us, Lord. Build your church through us. Build your church through us, Lord God. Upon this rock, you build your
not fail as a point of reference today. Uh, uh, Tori is going to be out in the lobby. I think she might even be holding a balloon or out in the lobby after service. I want to encourage you just to go up to her and say, yes, I'm taking that step right now. Put my name down. I'll serve at Fall Festival or if there's some, some other area, maybe I've mentioned an area that piqued your interest, just tell her that too and she'll just jot, jot your name down and we'll, we'll help you. We'll help you to take that step. Uh, that's, a, that's for serving. That's how you do it. Any other things, just come. Just come. And all the info's on our website. Just come. Show up. Be there. I've got one more invitation for you, whether you're online or in the room. I want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus. The way it works is being in a building does not make you the church. Faith in Jesus makes you the church. Following Jesus, being his apprentice, that is what makes you the church. And maybe you're not yet a part of the church. Let's get it. Let's do it. Let's do it now. How do you enter the church, enter the kingdom of God? It's very simple. Turn away from your sin. What is sin? Anything that harms yourself or others, anything that masters your life, anything that you bow down to, anything that you're a slave to, that is sin. Turn away from that. Turn your life over to Jesus and let him lead. That's it. You just start there and gather with the church. We'll go together. We'll take it from there. Would you bow your heads with me one more time? And if you're at home, would you pray this prayer with me? And right here, if you today would like to put your faith in Jesus and, and enter the church, enter the kingdom of God, if today is your day to do that, would you just raise your hand? And online, I can't see you back to the camera, but online, would you just raise your hand to God right where you are? Several hands here in the room saying, yes, I want to be a part of the church. Here's how to do it. I'm just going to coach you in a prayer. And I, I want to ask you to pray this prayer to Jesus. Talk to him. I'm going to coach you with some words, but don't say them to me. Say them to him, all right? And let's just support all those who are putting their faith in Jesus right now. Would you all repeat it after me? Jesus, say it out loud. Jesus, I invite you into my life. Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I choose to follow you and let you lead. I'll be your apprentice starting now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you are in the church. Would you just let me know by texting the word restart? You've restarted your life to the phone number 97,000. And then we'll get back to you and we'll help you with some next steps. Come That's on. right. Thank you, Pastor Garen. Church is not a spectator sport. That's right. Church is a team sport. Oh, I love that. Thank you, Pastor Garen. Well, hey, again, if it's your first time here, text the word GREET to 97000 and we will connect with you this week. We will. And um, if you're joining us online, would you just hit that subscribe button? All that does is it helps more people hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Oh, don't forget, um, Tori is going to be out in the lobby somewhere with a balloon, probably a big clipboard. If the Lord has just been touching your heart today, maybe he even has it. Maybe you just want to go of your own volition. Go do it. Serve. This is a way to get connected with our community. It's such a great way. Connected with our church. I encourage you to do that. There's so many places, ways you can serve. And then finally, we're setting up for Together Nights in the Worship Center here. So if I could use your help, I can't move all these chairs by myself. You could just meet me up at the front take three minutes. God bless you. See you next week.